The James Webb Space Telescope, an astounding piece of equipment built to outperform the Hubble Space Telescope, has made a terrifying and amazing discovery that might completely change our perception of the universe. It has successfully detected a faint glow coming from a staggering 7 trillion miles away. Can this glow be shining city lights coming from some mysterious extraterrestrial world galaxies away from us? Well, let's start from the beginning. A few years ago, NASA's Infrared Spitzer Space Telescope helped us spot a family of seven rocky exoplanets orbiting the same star. This star is known as TRAPPIST-1. And recently, our new infrared powerhouse, the James Webb Telescope, has measured the temperature of one of those distant worlds. It was a planet called TRAPPIST-1b. Unfortunately, it turned out that this Earth-like planet was totally uninhabitable. Astronomers took James Webb's mid-infrared camera, called MIRI, and looked at the planet's thermal emissions. We can picture the whole process as scientists using heat-sensing Terminator vision. The results were quite disappointing. TRAPPIST-1b turned out to be scorching. Its average temperature was around 450 degrees F. That's as hot as in an oven. Plus, the planet most likely doesn't have any atmosphere. At the same time, this discovery was another record-breaking first for the telescope, which had already produced some newsworthy results by that time. It was the first time researchers detected any form of light emitted by a small and relatively cool exoplanet similar to the rocky planets in our own solar system. No previous telescope had enough sensitivity to measure such dim, mid-infrared light. When seven TRAPPIST-1 exoplanets were first discovered, the astronomical community was ecstatic. That's because all those faraway worlds were about the size of our home planet and located in their star's habitable zone. It's the region that is just the right distance away from a star for liquid water to exist on a planet's surface. Thus, the planetary system became the best place to look for rocky planets with an atmosphere. But don't get too excited yet. These planets aren't likely to become new worlds for humans to explore. Mostly because the TRAPPIST-1 planets are totally out of our reach at the moment. They're just too far away, at a whopping 235 trillion miles away. Their star is also much smaller and redder than our sun. It's classified as an M dwarf star. In our home Milky Way galaxy, there are twice as many of such stars as there are stars like the sun. And they're also twice as likely to have rocky planets orbiting. It's probably not surprising that astronomers are very interested in such stars. They're the main targets for seeking potentially habitable planets. And it's also way easier and more convenient to observe rocky planets around such smaller stars. But there's a catch. M dwarfs are more active than our sun. They frequently flare and spew high energy rays which are likely to be extremely damaging to planets' atmospheres and any forms of extraterrestrial life. When researchers examined TRAPPIST-1b before, their observations weren't sensitive enough to determine whether this world had an atmosphere or if it was just a barren rock. But now, we know. The planet is tidally locked to its star, which means that one of its sides always faces the star while the other is stuck in perpetual darkness. The latest simulations suggest that if this planet had an atmosphere, its temperatures would be much lower since the air would redistribute the heat around both sides of the planet. Unfortunately, the James Webb Telescope recorded much hotter temperatures than needed for such a favorable scenario. It indicates the absence of an atmosphere and knocks the planet off our list of possibly habitable worlds. But the main excitement here isn't actually the features of TRAPPIST-1b. The main takeaway is that James Webb is capable of making such kinds of measurements. It'll help us explore the atmospheres and temperatures of many other distant worlds. The James Webb Telescope, or JWST, is like the ultimate intergalactic paparazzi. It takes pictures of some of the most famous celebrities in the universe. Stars, galaxies, exoplanets, you name it. The James Webb Space Telescope will snap a photo. So if you're a fan of cosmic celebrities, let's take a look at some of these best star-studded photos. The Carina Nebula. The image of the nebula with the beautiful name Carina was published on July 12th. JWST captured a beautiful view of the nebula, located about 7,500 light-years from Earth. Nicknamed the Cosmic Cliffs, it is, in fact, 
a hotbed of young stars, some of which are several times larger than our Sun. The Carina Nebula is a celestial spectacle located in the southern constellation Carina. It's really huge, approximately 260 light years across. Massive stars within this nebula are so bright and hot that they create a glowing cloud of gas and dust around them. The Carina Nebula also contains swirling clouds of gas and dust where new stars are being born. The gas collapses under its own weight, becomes hotter and denser, and all this eventually leads to the creation of new stars. However, the Carina Nebula isn't just some peaceful place of star formation. It's the site of some of the most destructive events in the universe, which create massive shockwaves that obliterate everything in their path. Very chaotic and cool. The Stephens Quintet This photo was also posted on July 12th. Stephens Quintet is a visual group of five galaxies located at a huge distance from us, about 290 million light years in the constellation of Pegasus. It's like a cosmic family reunion. All these galaxies are related to each other and interact with each other in some interesting ways. They're pulling and tugging on each other with their gravity, constantly exchanging gas and dust. This interaction is causing some of the galaxies to collide and merge, which can create all sorts of cool effects, like bursts of star formation and supernovae. Thanks to JWST, we were able to see shockwaves, tidal tails, and other amazing details about these galaxies. Their interactions create a stunning sight that we can see in this photo. Jupiter And here's our old giant friend. This image was published by NASA on August 22nd. Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system, and it's known for its many moons and its beautiful swirling clouds. But it also has a system of rings, just like Saturn, which are made up of tiny particles of dust that orbit the planet. These rings are much smaller and less visible than Saturn's, but they're still pretty neat. Jupiter also has auroras, which are colorful light displays that occur in the planet's atmosphere. They're caused by charged particles from the solar wind interacting with Jupiter's magnetic field. Just like on Earth, they can be seen near the poles of the planet. But these auroras are much brighter and more intense than ours. We can even see this crazy light show from space. And now, we were finally able to capture this dazzling sight. JWST's photo shows the auroras of Jupiter, its rings, and even two moons, Amalthea and Adrastea. It's amazing how bright and clear they are on this photo. The Cartwheel Galaxy NASA released this image on August 2nd. This photo shows us the Cartwheel Galaxy and its companions. The Cartwheel Galaxy gets its name from its shape. It kind of looks like a cartwheel, doesn't it? This is a giant swirling mass of stars, gas, and dust, which is located in the depths of space. It's shaped like a pinwheel with long spiral arms. These arms are held together by the gravity of the central region, which is home to a supermassive black hole. But the Cartwheel Galaxy is a bit different from its spiral relatives. It has formed when a smaller galaxy collided with a larger one, creating a shockwave that rippled through the gas and dust. We'll definitely have to visit this galaxy someday. It's sure to be a wild ride. Spiral Galaxy M74 And here comes another spiral galaxy. NASA released this image on July 22nd. JWST had to peer through thick layers of dust and gas to see this beautiful star cluster. M74 belongs to a special class of spiral galaxies known as the Grand Design Galaxy. This means that its spiral arms are noticeable and clearly outlined. All sorts of amazing things are happening inside of spiral galaxies. Supernovas, stars being born in clouds of gas and dust, and many other cosmic wonders. The glowing gas and dust, the bright stars, and the swirling patterns of the spiral arms make them some of the most striking objects in the universe.
Well, we can clearly see it on the example of M74. The Tarantula Nebula This image of the nebula with a creepy name Tarantula was published on September 6th. The photo covers as much as 340 light years across. This is a huge distance! Thanks to this image, astronomers have discovered new young stars that were previously shrouded in dust. The Tarantula Nebula is located 160,000 light years away from us, in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's the largest and brightest star forming region in the local group, the galaxies nearest our Milky Way. It's named after its shape, which looks like a bit like the legs of a big tarantula. It's a vast region of space, about 1,000 light years across, and it's home to some of the most massive and luminous stars in the universe. One of the reasons why the Tarantula Nebula is interesting to scientists is its composition. Its composition is close to the region of stars of the cosmic noon, the so-called state of our universe when it was only a few billion years old. At that time, star formation was at its peak. Thanks to the Webb telescope, we can study this galaxy better and find out what our universe was like at its peak. Neptune's Rings This photo was published on September 21st, 2022. In this photo, we can even see six small moons next to the planet, with Triton shining brightly in the upper left corner. You didn't think it was the sun, did you? And yep, Neptune has rings too! They're like the ultimate cosmic accessory. They add a touch of glamour and style to the planet. But unlike some earthly bling, these rings are made of small particles of dust rather than diamonds and gold. There are five known rings around Neptune. The Gaul, Le Verrier, La Celle, Arago, and Adam's rings. Scientists think that these are relatively young, much younger than our solar system and much younger than, for example, Uranus's rings. They were probably created when one of Neptune's inner moons got too close to the planet and was torn apart by gravity. We haven't seen Neptune's ring so brightly since Voyager 2 flew past it back in 1989. So this is a great opportunity to take a closer look at these rings. The Pillars of Creation This photo was published on October 19th. The Pillars of Creation became famous thanks to the Hubble telescope. But this photo is very lush and much more detailed. These columns, located in the Eagle Nebula, are about 5 light years tall, which is really, really long. And they look like some majestic rock formations, only much more transparent. Just like a typical Hollywood movie set, they're full of action and special effects. They're home to some of the most dramatic processes in the universe. The gas and dust are collapsing under their own gravity forming clumps that will eventually become stars. The place is full of intense radiation, jets of high-energy particles, and supernovae. It's like a cosmic version of Survivor. And if this wasn't creepy enough, here's another photo published by NASA on October 19th. They shared it right before Halloween. Here, the pillars resemble an eerie hand reaching for something. Brr. Anyway. All these photos give us a truly awe-inspiring sight. They remind us of the incredible complexity of the universe and the amazing things that are happening even in the darkest and most remote corners of the cosmos. Let's hope that the James Webb Telescope will continue to amaze us in the future. Hundreds of diplomatic spaceships take off from Earth and head into space. When they reach their destination, they're met by hundreds of alien ships. This is humanity's first contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. People managed to detect them not so long ago, in a star system very close to our home. It's Proxima Centauri. This red dwarf star is the closest to our solar system. It's seven times smaller than our Sun, which makes it only 50% bigger than Jupiter. Proxima Centauri is also eight times as light as the Sun. This star system is 4.2 light years away. That's how long it takes a photon of light to travel from this star to Earth. By comparison, it only takes 8 minutes for sunlight to reach our planet. If you decided to travel to Proxima Centauri, it would take you about 73,000 years to fly there in a conventional rocket. That's longer than our intelligent civilization has even existed. 
But it's not the star itself that interests us. It's the planet orbiting it. That's Proxima Centauri b. It's 17% bigger than Earth and about 10% heavier. It orbits its star at a distance of 4.5 million miles. By comparison, Earth is 93 million miles away from the Sun. That's 20 times farther. But the host star, Proxima Centauri, is a red dwarf. It doesn't emit as much light and heat as our Sun. So the planet Proxima Centauri b is right in the habitable zone of the star. It's located at such a perfect distance from its mother star that the planet neither gets too hot nor turns into a block of ice. In other words, the temperature there makes it possible for water to exist in its liquid state. This means that Proxima Centauri b could host life. But further observations of the planet make it doubtful. The host star is very unstable. Its brightness changes too frequently. In 2017, astronomers witnessed a catastrophic flash. The star increased its brightness by 1,000 times for 10 seconds. Before that, there was another weaker flash. The planet received an enormous amount of radiation. If there had been life there, that flare would have wiped it out completely. Overall, Proxima Centauri b receives about 400 times more X-rays than Earth. Complex living organisms cannot live under such conditions. Scientists say that even if there was an atmosphere and an ocean on Proxima Centauri b, this constant radiation would simply blow them off the planet. Proxima Centauri b is so close to its host star that it's gravitationally locked to it. This means that the planet is always turned to the star with only one side, just like the moon is turned toward Earth. That means that only one side of the planet receives this awful amount of radiation. And some experts speculate that an intelligent civilization might live on the night side of the planet. And it could be this civilization that sent us the strange signal that astronomers caught in 2019. Scientists described it as, quote, a bright long duration optical flare, accompanied by a series of intense coherent radio bursts. This radio signal was observed for 30 days by one of the radio telescopes on Earth. Scientists thought the signal was artificial and could have been sent by an extraterrestrial civilization. Presumably, the signal came from Proxima Centauri b, or one of the moons that might be in that star system. But further observations failed to detect the signal. Now, the main theory claims that this radio signal is just some kind of interference from some technology on Earth. But what if it was really sent by a civilization living on the dark side of Proxima Centauri b? Well, we may soon find out for sure people are launching a brand new telescope into space. It's the James Webb Space Telescope. It's scheduled to be launched at the end of 2021. A booster rocket will take off from Earth and reach orbit. Then, it'll deliver the telescope to a specific point between our planet and the Sun, where their gravitational forces are roughly equal. Plus, there's no light pollution in space, unlike on Earth's surface. There are also no clouds or other weather conditions that might interfere with the telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope will replace the Hubble Telescope, which has been operating in space since 1990. The new telescope costs $9.8 billion. And here's why. It'll use a mirror as wide as a boxing ring. This will allow the telescope to see very far into space. So far, in fact, that the light from some events happening there won't have reached Earth yet. This means we will literally be able to look back in time. The James Webb Space Telescope will see the universe almost immediately after the Big Bang. We'll see how the first stars and galaxies were born, and how the universe turned into what we observe today. But also, this telescope can be used to examine Proxima Centauri b. Astronomers will be looking for artificial light there, like the LED lights we have on Earth. If Proxima Centauri b really hosts life on its night side, then the locals must have learned to transfer heat and light from the day side of the planet, and they would have to use artificial light to support life on their side. The James Webb Space Telescope is powerful enough to distinguish the light waves emitted by the star from those that might be created by someone on the dark side of the planet. And if we do detect some artificial light, we'll have the first ever confirmation that an intelligent civilization might exist outside our solar system. But there's always room for error in calculations and data interpretation. The only way to establish the truth once and for all is to send a space probe to Proxima Centauri. Then we can get real pictures of the planet. The main problem is distance. 
Although Proxima Centauri is the closest to the Earth's star system, it still takes tens of thousands of years to get there. After all, the Voyager 1 space probe needed about 44 years just to leave the solar system. And that's just a small step compared to the actual distance to the nearest star. So we need other methods of travel, and they have to be much faster. Some scientists want to send microprobes to Proxima Centauri b. They won't be any heavier than a sewing needle. A launch vehicle will deploy about a thousand of these probes into orbit. Then they will unfold a space sail. This is an ultralight material that will use the power of light to create thrust. When the sail is deployed, we'll focus a powerful laser beam onto it. This will accelerate the probes to about 20% of the speed of light. This will be an absolute speed record by our standards, but it'll still take about 21 years for these probes to reach their destination. And we'll have to wait for about four more years just to get the first signal from them. The Proxima Centauri star system isn't the only potential world to host life. And one of the tasks of the James Webb Space Telescope is to look out for other worlds. The telescope's powerful instruments will allow it to find relatively cold planets where temperatures are close to those on Earth. We'll be able to study in detail around two dozen nearby star systems, and we'll be able to detect not only planets themselves, but also their moons. Scientists expect a boom in the discovery of exoplanets. From the start of the telescope in 2022, we'll constantly be detecting new worlds and learning more about those already discovered. The James Webb Space Telescope will allow us to better study our own solar system. Jupiter's moon Europa, for example. Scientists believe there might be water there. Although Europa looks like a block of ice, the moon's gravitational interaction with Jupiter heats its core. That likely makes the ice deep below the surface melt. So there's likely to be an ocean under the ice crust. Similar conditions could exist on Enceladus, Saturn's moon. This moon is geologically active. There are geysers that burst out of the cracks on the moon's surface. The James Webb Space Telescope's infrared instruments will be able to explore Europa and Enceladus in search of biosignatures. Those are the traces of life activity of living organisms or bacteria. This telescope is scheduled to operate for about six years. But in the future, we'll launch an even bigger one. It's called Louvoir, which stands for the Large UV Optical Infrared Surveyor. Its mirror will be twice the size of that of the James Webb Space Telescope and almost seven times the size of the Hubble's. The telescope is scheduled to be launched in 2039. We'll get it into orbit with the help of a super heavy rocket. Then we'll have to deliver the telescope to its destination, one million miles away from Earth. And then it'll begin its observations. We could learn to travel faster than the speed of light by that time. Then, if we find a potentially habitable planet with the help of the telescope, we can send a space probe or even a team of explorers there. In this case, a diplomatic meeting with an extraterrestrial civilization might become a reality. It's been more than a year since the James Webb Telescope, which had taken over 20 years to complete, was launched. And for such a relatively short time, the ultra-modern and most powerful in history piece of equipment has already made plenty of discoveries. By observing the universe at infrared wavelength, James Webb lets us see things no other telescope has ever shown before. The primary goal of this incredible piece of equipment is to study the formation of galaxies and stars that appeared in the early universe. For example, look at the closest to us stellar nursery, a region of space where new stars get born. NASA has shared an image from James Webb that shows a small star-forming region. If you look at the picture attentively, you'll see jets bursting from infant stars. Around them, different colored clouds of cosmic dust are colliding with one another. The view is mesmerizing. The red dust consists of molecular hydrogen. You can also notice that some stars have something like shadows. Those hint at the creation of what will later become planets. At first sight, the image may seem chaotic, but astronomers claim that it's a relatively small and quiet stellar nursery in comparison to some others. Many young stars there are similar in size to our sun, or a bit smaller. The photo itself was taken with the help of Webb's near-infrared camera, NIRCAM. It's the observatory's primary camera that snaps images of the cosmos in two different infrared ranges. 
Another amazing discovery the Webb telescope has made is smoke molecules in a distant galaxy. It's the first time such molecules have been discovered so far away from our planet. The galaxy in question lies 12.3 billion light years away from Earth. It most likely formed about one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. Despite such a huge distance between the galaxy and our planet, scientists have managed to detect chemical compounds found in soot or smoke, and it's quite a big deal since it has pushed the record for detecting similar complex molecules back by around a billion years. This study has also confirmed the sheer power of the coolest piece of space equipment of all time. It managed to make this discovery despite the fact that the spectrometer needed for the measurements didn't perform to the fullest after having experienced a sudden and surprising degradation. The James Webb Telescope has also helped to boost our understanding of exoplanets. Those are planets orbiting stars other than our own sun. At the beginning of 2023, the observatory spotted its first exoplanet, LHS 475b. It's located 41 light years away from Earth and is approximately the same size as our planet. According to NASA, nowadays, James Webb is the only operating telescope capable of categorizing the atmosphere of Earth-sized exoplanets. The research team behind the discovery believes such results underline the precision of the telescope. They hope that it will help us locate many more rocky exoplanets that we might be able to colonize in the future. Even though, at first sight, it may seem that the universe is pretty empty, it's actually a very busy place. And Webb has all the necessary instruments to see all kinds of cosmic events happening out there. Just look at this image of WR-124. It's a star on the cusp of its explosive demise. In the image, the star is about to go supernova. It happens when a star runs out of its fuel and explodes at the end of its life cycle, releasing a giant cloud of space dust and hot gas into space. The star captured by the Webb telescope was at the wolf rayet stage of its life. That's a period when a star is shedding its outer layers before going supernova. The next amazing thing discovered by James Webb is a star-planet hybrid with very strange clouds. This bizarre world, VHS 1256b, is actually a brown dwarf. Those are bigger than planets but too small to classify as stars. They emit some light of their own and are quite hot. But their mass is simply not enough to fuse hydrogen into helium like full-fledged stars do. Space bodies of this kind aren't actually brown. They occur in a wide variety of colors, but those are mostly invisible to the human eye. What we can see is the light they emit, and to us, it appears to be dark orange or magenta. The brown dwarf discovered by the Webb telescope is almost 20 times the size of Jupiter. It orbits two red dwarf stars, and to complete one orbit, it needs over 10,000 years. Astronomers first found out about this unusual exoplanet in 2016, but at that time, they didn't classify it as a brown dwarf and, thus, couldn't explain its puzzling reddish glow. Now, thanks to the James Webb Telescope, they know the space object's origin. Anyway, back to those clouds. As you know, clouds on Earth are made of water vapor, but those on the brown dwarf are different. They seem to be made of... sand. It looks like good old sand from Earth, but it's actually not. The clouds are made of tiny particles of silicate. Another recent discovery involves several large galaxies that scientists believe were born not long after the Big Bang. They aren't supposed to be there, and no one expected to find them. But the James Webb Space Telescope has spotted them. These galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, are full of mature red stars. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from them and estimated their age 5 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. It means that they came into being when our universe was very young, almost a baby. But the most bizarre thing about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars dwelling there. The data received by the telescope don't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. It also doesn't match the earlier observations made by Hubble. And here, James Webb has captured a distant region of space in unprecedented detail. This section of space is known as Pandora's Cluster. In the image, you can see three massive clusters of galaxies coming together and forming a mega cluster. 
The combined mass of these clusters acts as a powerful gravitational lens. And thanks to this natural magnification effect, scientists can see other galaxies in the region. Astronomers claim that the most recent image of Pandora's cluster is stronger and deeper than they have ever seen. James Webb has also managed to spot thousands of young stars never seen before in the Tarantula Nebula. This space formation got its nickname because of the appearance of dusty filaments spotted in previous images. It's the biggest star-forming region in the local group, which includes the galaxies nearest to the Milky Way. The Webb Telescope's images have helped to shed light on the composition of the Tarantula Nebula. The telescope has also detected protostars, infant stars in the process of gaining mass. Astronomers expect that these protostars will eventually form and shape the nebula further. Among other discoveries made by the James Webb Telescope, you can see the birth of 50 distant stars. Some of them power protoplanetary disks, which might later form solar systems light years away from our own. Here's one more image from James Webb. You can see a supermassive black hole that has a mass of 9 billion suns. It's so ginormous and ancient that scientists are struggling to explain its existence. Astronomers have also discovered a distant ring of dust, rock, and gas that contains a chemical called methylcation. It's known as a molecular building block of life, and it makes most of the organic material on our planet. James Webb helped researchers see powerful sandstorms on a planet 235 trillion miles away. Astronomers were happy to discover this treasure chest of countless tiny sand particles. Now look at this. Do you recognize this image? Those are the so-called pillars of creation. But this new view shows us just how star-speckled that dusty region actually is. You can compare the new photo with the one taken by Hubble in 2014. This is astonishing proof of scientific progress. Hey there, Earthling! If you think you're special because you live on the only habitable planet out there, think again. What makes a planet suitable for life? A whole bunch of factors, like the planet itself, its neighbors, and the star it orbits. A habitable planet is basically one that can sustain life, with things like access to water, energy sources, and nutrients. Earth, for example, is in the sweet spot, known as the habitable zone, where it can have liquid water on its surface. But just being in this zone doesn't automatically mean a planet is habitable. Factors like crazy levels of radiation can make a planet uninhabitable, even if it has the right temperature. So the bottom line is, we need water, something to orbit, and a set of nutrients of chemical origin that can be found in Mendeleev's periodic table of the elements or those funky snacks you buy. Look at this exoplanet called K218b. Mm. The term exoplanet doesn't mean that it's exotic. It just states that this planet is located outside the solar system. Most planets need to orbit something, unless we're talking about rogue planets that are basically planet-sized things floating around in space but not orbiting around any star or brown dwarf. Instead of our Sun, K218b orbits a red dwarf called K218. It's not your average star you can see with the unaided eye in the night sky. This one is hard to observe because of its low luminosity. K218b is indeed a planet far, far away. It's located 38 parsecs away from Earth. One parsec is somewhere around 19 trillion miles. Hey, you do the math. Hint, lots of zeros. K218b is a sub-Neptune, meaning that it has a smaller radius than Neptune. However, it's much bigger than our humble abode. It's about 2.6 times the radius of Earth. As for the weight, K218b is way chunkier than Earth. It's about 8 times as massive. It takes 33 days for this planet to go around its star, and it gets just about as much starlight as Earth gets from the Sun. This planet has a light intensity of 1.28 times greater than Earth and has an equilibrium temperature of 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Nope, it doesn't mean that K218b feels like New York in January. It only gives us an idea of the theoretical temperature put there. The planetary equilibrium temperature is basically the temperature a planet would have if it was perfectly balanced in terms of radiation. 
It's when the amount of heat leaving a planet is the same as the amount of heat coming in. Now, the trillions of miles that set us apart aren't a problem for potent telescopes, such as the Kepler Space Telescope that discovered this planet and the James Webb Space Telescope that is studying its atmosphere now. In 2019, scientists announced that they had found water vapor in the atmosphere of exoplanet K218b, which sparked widespread interest toward this outlandish world. Four years later, the Webb Telescope detected carbon dioxide and methane swirling in the air of this guy. Carbon dioxide is basically our best friend here on Earth. Humans need it to breathe properly and keep our blood pH in check. And plants love this stuff too, because it helps them make oxygen through photosynthesis. Obviously, we can't survive without it. Without methane either. However, this little gem got some scientists buzzing with excitement even more due to the discovery of some funky dimethyl sulfide gas molecules in its atmosphere. In 2023, scientists from the University of Cambridge spotted carbon-based molecules like methane and carbon dioxide hanging out on K218b with the help of JWST. This could mean that this exoplanet might feature a hydrogen-rich atmosphere and a watery surface. There's a potential whiff of dimethyl sulfide, or simply DMS, in the mix. On Earth, this stuff is usually linked to life, since it's normally produced by photoplankton in the oceans. The fact that we're picking up hints of DMS on K218b is like finding a golden ticket in the cosmic chocolate bar. Hey, kind of gives you the willies now, doesn't it? <laughs> Why is DMS so important, you ask? Well, it's a bit of a superhero on our planet, playing a crucial role in the sulfur cycle and even affecting our climate by helping clouds form. And spotting DMS on other planets could be a sign of life similar to ours. Looks like this planet is a nice spot with its not that rough temperature and all the right nutrients to keep us alive. So what's your take on its overall look? It probably took the planet a good few million years to come together. While things might heat up deep down underground, it shouldn't make a big difference on the surface. Some experts believe it could be home to a water or molten lava ocean, with a hydrogen-rich atmosphere resembling a gas giant like Uranus or Neptune. Now this one doesn't really match our Earth standards, since our atmosphere is mostly made of nitrogen. If there's an ocean, it's likely under a thick layer of ice and rock, which could mess with the planet's climate. Once things get really hot, the line between the ocean and the sky blurs. We're not totally sure if there's a liquid ocean on K218b, and it's tricky to see one from afar. Just looking at the planet's size and weight won't give us the answer. The whole liquid water ocean thing is up in the air. <laughs> Initially, we thought water in a supercritical state was most likely, but new observations point toward a liquid ocean. Suspicious gases like hydrocarbons and ammonia might be moving from the air into the water if there's an ocean, which could mean no clear line between the sky and the sea. But some experts say a molten rock ocean could be doing the same trick. Others think a gas-rich mini-Neptune setup could explain things too. The Hubble Space Telescope did some snooping and found that K218b is rocking an atmosphere filled with hydrogen. They think there might be some water vapor hanging out there, too. But it's a bit of a mystery. Apparently, the James Webb Space Telescope got a peak and saw less than 0.1% water vapor, possibly because the planet has a dry stratosphere vibe going on. As for ammonia, it's nearly non-existent in that distant world. Methane and carbon dioxide seem to be dominant in the atmosphere, making up about 1%. But don't expect to see any other carbon oxides crashing the party. Their concentration is just a guess at this point. The atmosphere of K218b is just a small fraction of its total mass, around 6.2%, and has probably got a similar vibe to Uranus and Neptune. Haze-wise, there's not much going on. And water clouds are a bit of a mystery. They're probably icy, although there's a chance for some liquid water clouds too. Now, besides water, the atmosphere could also contain some ammonium chloride, 
sodium sulfide, potassium chloride, and zinc sulfide clouds, depending on what the planet is into. And it seems like things might get a bit turned up high in the atmosphere, with the temperature inversion causing a stratosphere situation – just your average day in outer space. So far, scientists have come up with several climate models this planet might have. For example, some of them think that there's the same temperature across the whole planet. Unless the planet is spinning super fast, and the temperature difference between the poles and the equator is minor. But these are all speculations at this point. The amount of radiation K218b gets from his star is similar to what Earth gets. The temperature on the planet might be anywhere from really cold to pretty warm. Whether it can support life depends on its atmosphere and clouds. Scientists think microorganisms from Earth could survive there, even with all the hydrogen. But it's still hard to tell if there's life on K218b, because the gases we usually look for might not work in its atmosphere. Scientists think the James Webb Space Telescope might be able to detect different markers of life on the planet with enough observations. Wow, the James Webb Telescope has been fully deployed! If you're interested in astronomy or space, you've got to be excited about the James Webb Space Telescope. Here's why. For starters, it's huge. How huge? The primary mirror of the JWST is over 21 feet wide. The Hubble Space Telescope, the previous largest eye in space, has a mirror of about 7 feet 10 and a half inches. By comparison, if you place the two telescopes side by side, it'd be like putting a horse next to an elephant. And elephants are enormous. There's a perfect reason why the web, as it's affectionately called, is massive. It has to be huge, because it's not an optical telescope in the traditional sense that most telescopes are. The JWST is an infrared telescope. It sees heat. Infrared light has a longer wavelength than visible light, so it needs a larger mirror to focus that light. So what do we have here with the James Webb Space Telescope? We have two never-before things going on. We have incredible technology and incredible science missions. Both the missions and the technology are out of this world cutting edge. The web is a classic example of engineering in the service of science. Because of its greater light gathering power, the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to take images of things that we were never able to see before, but have always wanted to see. Things like exoplanets and the first galaxies in the universe and stars and planets forming inside nebulae. And you can bet that there will be plenty of surprises, too. The James Webb Space Telescope has several technological tricks up its sleeve, which promise to provide its greatest scientific discoveries. The Webb has a coronagraph, and a very special coronagraph at that. The coronagraph is the tool that will allow the first real pictures of exoplanets. The coronagraph blocks out the bright pinpoint light of stars, which we already know have planets orbiting around them. Without the coronagraph, the starlight would make things too bright to see these planets, because planets are hundreds of thousands of times dimmer than the star. But with the coronagraph blocking the starlight, the exoplanets come into view, and the JWST coronagraph can block the light from up to a hundred stars at once. We can expect a swarm of exoplanets. This brings us to the next high-tech gadget the JWST has up its sleeve, a no-slit spectrograph. Usually, an ordinary spectrograph will have a slit to allow a sliver of light to enter and be diffracted. Diffraction is the scattering of light to reveal the spectrum of the light's component wavelengths. But the James Webb Space Telescope's work is so sensitive that a sliver of light would overwhelm the optics. So a no-slit spectrograph was installed. The starlight gathered from the big mirror is sent into a fiber optic cable to send only a single spot of light into the spectroscope. And that's where the grism takes over. Sir Isaac Newton used a prism to discover the spectrum of sunlight, Roy G. Biv, as you may recall. But the web uses a grism. That's a compound word, like smog, which is smoke and fog. A grism is a graded prism. That means it has itsy bitsy, teeny tiny grooves that diffract the spot of light the big mirror sends down the fiber optic cable and into the spectrograph. The science of reading a spectrum of light is called spectroscopy. By analyzing the spectra of light from the exoplanets, the JWST will determine what gases are in the planet's atmospheres, as well as their density and even their temperature. It's an incredible advance in our knowledge. 
we'll be able to tell if a planet has oxygen or nitrogen or methane and other gases that may or may not indicate that the planet is habitable. Another Earth, perhaps. Presently, the JWST is parked in its permanent location. Unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which orbits the Earth, the James Webb Space Telescope orbits the Sun. It orbits the Sun at one of the gravitational balance points between the Earth-Sun system. It just stays there, without having to use much or any fuel to hold its position. So, as the Earth orbits the Sun, the James Webb remains parked at a spot that is also orbiting the Sun. There are five gravitational balance points between the Earth and Sun. They are called Lagrange points, after their discoverer, Joseph Louis Lagrange, in the 18th century. The Webb is parked at L2, the second of the five Lagrange points, which lies 932,000 miles out into space, way beyond the moon. All this to observe a spot of infrared light. But first, the engineers must get, or acquire, that spot of light. To get a spot of infrared light, the 18 hexagonal mirrors had to be unfolded from their position inside the Ariane rocket that sent the web into space. Once the mirrors have unfolded, their positions must be adjusted to microscopic level accuracy so that all 18 mirrors produce a single image. Several tiny motors are attached to each mirror segment to make these adjustments. These motors, which must be activated individually, will gradually pull the honeycomb-like mirror segments into alignment. It's a critical part of the mission and takes months to complete. To align the mirrors to produce a single spot of light, the James Webb Space Telescope can't be jiggling around. The telescope must be kept absolutely motionless, and that requires two other cutting-edge technologies, the sun shield and the cryocooler. In space, direct sunlight is very hot, and shadow is very cold. Therefore, the James Webb Space Telescope brought along its own high-tech sun shield. It's huge, too, as big as a tennis court huge. Comprised of five individual layers of Kapton film, only a millimeter thick, each layer of the sunshield has to be remotely deployed individually using a system of eight motors and 139 actuators with thousands of parts. The purpose of the sunshield is to help the JWST stay cold. The colder, the better. And colder is what the cryocooler is for. Temperature can be measured three different ways. In degrees Fahrenheit, where water freezes at 32 degrees and boils at 212. In degrees Celsius, where water freezes at zero degrees and boils at 100 degrees. But neither of these thermometers have a starting point. So Lord Kelvin, in the 19th century, devised a third temperature scale, the Kelvin scale, which starts at absolute zero, the coldest temperature possible. The onboard cryocooler will cool the JWST to just seven degrees Kelvin, seven degrees above absolute zero. At this temperature, virtually all heat from motors is removed, and the telescope will be able to focus the light to a point without any noise, basically any motion interfering with the quality of the image. Finally, after all this incredible technology functions remotely as planned, we are almost ready to observe the infrared images from the giant multi-segmented mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope. Almost ready. A telescope can collect all the light it wants, but in the end, it must also be able to detect what it's collected. If the light is not detected, it's not truly observed. Enter the piece de resistance, the infrared detectors. The web has 15 of them. The specially fabricated semiconductor material produces a slight electrical charge when struck by a photon of infrared light. The web's infrared detectors can produce a million pixel high def image. A few of the detectors can produce a four million pixel image. They must be durable enough to last 10 to 20 years without warping or corrupting, all while working at seven degrees above absolute zero. In themselves, the infrared detectors on the JWST are an engineering marvel. But what are they going to take pictures of? Ah, the missions of the JWST. Well, they're cutting edge too. 70 of the first 280 target observations are exoplanets. Is there another Earth? Which exoplanets seem habitable? The Webb Telescope will provide detailed spectroscopic analysis of the atmospheres of thousands of known exoplanets. For the first time, we will see images of exoplanets as they appear in infrared light. Cosmology, the study of the universe, is perhaps the primary mission for the web. 
Galaxies receding away so fast that their light is stretched into the infrared will be a prime target for observation. Hundreds of hours of observations are necessary to collect the faint infrared light from these first galaxies formed after the Big Bang. The JWST will give us a picture of what the infant universe looked like. Astronomers will learn new information about the dark energy that is driving the expansion of the universe and what role, if any, black holes play in the formation of galaxies. Star formation in the Milky Way and nearby galaxies is also part of the mission of the James Webb. By imaging hundreds of solar systems forming around newborn stars, astronomers will establish a definite history of solar system development. Now fact will replace theory, and a big step forward will be taken in our understanding of space. The James Webb Space Telescope is a bold endeavor that will mark an epoch time in scientific history. The search for ET is on. It's most definitely on. With the successful launch of the James Webb Telescope, the search for Earth-like planets has become a riveting topic of worldwide attention. Apart from the James Webb Telescope, other tools are being used to find good Earth-like candidates. The TESS satellite and the Kepler telescope are at the forefront of searching for other Earths. After we first clear the air of a few pesky philosophical questions, we'll take a close look at these two searches and what the James Webb Telescope hopes to find. So, why are we searching for Earth-like planets? Well, because we can. Incredible advances in Earth-bound telescope technology have enabled ultra-precise observations of starlight, which led to the earliest discovery of exoplanets. As planets go around stars, there's a gravitational interaction between the planet and the star. They pull each other. The planet's pull upon the star will cause the starlight to wobble back and forth ever so slightly as the planet or planets orbit the star. This has always been the case, but the wobble of the starlight was never able to be detected, because starlight always twinkles. You know, twinkle, twinkle, etc. Adaptive optics inside telescopes is the technological breakthrough that first enabled astronomers to find exoplanets by taking the twinkle out of starlight. Mechanical springs on the underside of telescope mirrors bend the mirrors ever so slightly to neutralize the distortion, the twinkle, caused by starlight passing through Earth's atmosphere. Without the glimmer of starlight, the slight wobble caused by planets pulling gravitationally on the stars is observable. The bigger the wobble, the more planets. It's called the astrometric method of exoplanet detection. Isn't that a mouthful? Whole star systems and literally thousands of exoplanets were inferred to exist around nearby stars by analyzing the wobbly patterns of starlight. But the planets themselves could not be seen. Suddenly, our solar system was not unique anymore. Astronomers got giddy over the inescapable conclusion that probably every star had planets. It became impossible not to ask the poignant question, is the Earth unique or are there other Earths? What's the big deal about finding Earth-like planets anyways? Well, considering all the financial resources the developed countries are spending on finding Earth-like planets, it can be said without a doubt that it's definitely a big deal including the launch James Webb Telescope, which cost 10 billion US dollars, the Kepler Space Telescope, which cost 550 million US dollars, and the TESS satellite, which cost 200 million US dollars. The investment in finding Earth-like planets is certainly eyebrow-raising. Now, if you keep in mind that these costs are just for the hardware and to get a sketch of the full magnitude of the search, you must also include the salaries of a team of data miners, PhD analysts, and postgrads all across the globe in universities, national space agencies, and private institutions. We will conclude that finding another Earth is truly an immense undertaking. Now, suppose we find one, then Earth is not alone anymore. It's not that we can actually go to any of these planets anytime soon. Interstellar travel requires some breakthroughs in physics and technology, and, well, we aren't there yet. But knowing that there are planets out there in the Milky Way that are like Earth in all the essential respects, like liquid water, oxygen, and habitability, will make space less foreboding, more welcoming, more exciting to study and explore. It may also give us more pride in our home planet and make us all better Earthlings. The triple mission looking for other Earths, the Kepler telescope, the TESS satellite, and the James Webb telescope use distinct approaches to find exoplanets. And the synonym TESS tells us what that method is. The T stands for transiting, and that's the key to the whole exoplanet search. 
E stands for, you guessed it, exoplanets, the target of the excellent investigation of another Earth. S stands for survey, because TESS looks at hundreds of thousands of nearby stars. And S stands for satellite, because TESS is orbiting Earth, unlike the James Webb Space Telescope, which will orbit the Sun. When a planet passes in front of a star, that is called a transit. The planet will block some of the light coming from the star. This decrease or dimming of the star can be measured. The dimming of starlight tells lots of things about the planet. By knowing how bright the star is, and how much the star's light was dimmed by a transition in front of the star, we can tell how giant the planet is or how close it is. But we won't know which. Is it big or is it close? Until the planet's orbit is also timed. It means our test satellite must take long-duration videos of the stars. Ooh, video of the stars. Hollywood should like that. The test satellite doesn't have a telescope. It uses four CCD cameras to stream live long-duration videos of as many stars as possible. Hundreds of thousands of stars. Why so many? Well, because for a transit of a planet to be observed, it must pass directly between the test satellite's cameras and the star. If the planet is not on the exact line-of-sight angle between the star and Tess's cameras, it cannot be seen because it will not cut off any starlights. Planetary transits are rare. For example, Venus passes across Earth's view of the Sun only every couple hundred years. Yet, Tess's cameras are seeing many planetary transits among the hundreds of thousands of stars it takes streaming long-duration videos of, and you know what that means. It means there must be hundreds or thousands of times more planets than are observed by the transiting method. It is, therefore, an inescapable conclusion that every star has planets. Planets are everywhere. And now, the James Webb Space Telescope, with its giant 21-foot, 4-inch wide mirror, is entering the search. It is a technological marvel, a wonder of the modern world, a miracle of advanced engineering. Anticipation is reaching a fever pitch. But with the heightened anticipation comes an almost equal amount of trepidation. And some things can still go wrong before the James Webb Space Telescope returns its first pictures. After the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, was launched in 1990, a repair mission had to be launched in 1993. The mirror on the Hubble was not very well inspected, and its pictures were very blurry. Astronauts had to go up and execute a spectacular spacewalk to fix the mirror. After the fix, the pictures Hubble sent back were more precise than it was ever designed for. This is how an improved model appeared. That cannot happen with the James Webb Telescope. The Hubble orbits the Earth and is accessible to astronauts. The James Webb Space Telescope orbits the Sun and is well beyond the Moon, out of the reach of astronauts, because there is no spacecraft equipped to carry him there. It cannot be manually fixed if something goes wrong. Adding to the challenges, the James Webb Space Telescope has only one onboard camera to inspect any damage it may suffer or mechanical malfunctions that might develop in the harsh environment of interplanetary space. Any remote fixes will need to be done blind from Earth. The James Webb Space Telescope is now fully deployed. The 18 mirror segments will need to be aligned to produce a single image. This critically important process will take several months to complete once the telescope is fully deployed. 70 of the first 286 observation assignments of the telescope target exoplanets. Using data from previous exoplanet searches, it will not have to waste time searching for exoplanets. Their locations and orbits are already known. The James Webb Telescope will go right after them. The James Webb Space Telescope is not an optical telescope in the same sense as the Hubble Space Telescope or any ordinary telescope that sees visible light. It sees infrared light. The pictures of planets are expected to be bright dots, somewhat fuzzy if they have atmospheres. The spectra of the planets will yield the most information about the exoplanet. Any gases around an exoplanet will absorb some starlight as the starlight passes through the planet's atmospheres. Suppose there is methane in the planet's atmosphere, oxygen, or carbon dioxide, the gases that most indicate life. In that case, the James Webb Telescope will be able to pick them up by spectroscopic analysis. An entire portrait of the exoplanet can be formed from the infrared information, its temperature ranges, atmospheric content, the likelihood of liquid water, and even the probability of life. And that's a big deal! 
The James Webb Space Telescope has other missions to perform, too. It's assigned to examine star formation and planet formation in nebula in the Milky Way. Understanding how solar systems form is part of the search for another Earth. By detecting infrared light, the James Webb Space Telescope will peer to the farthest away galaxies, galaxies whose visible light gets blocked by dust and gas. These distant galaxies were formed shortly after the Big Bang. Galaxy formation is an essential mission for the James Webb Telescope. These most distant galaxies are accelerating away so fast that the light they emit is stretched below the frequency of the visible spectrum, into the infrared. The Great Telescope can see these previously invisible galaxies. We hope to learn about the mysterious dark energy that is causing the universe to expand at an ever-increasing velocity. Hope is high that the James Webb Space Telescope will significantly expand our knowledge of this amazing universe we all live in. The James Webb Space Telescope has recently discovered the oldest black hole ever found. It's an ancient monster as massive as 1.6 million suns, and it's lurking 13 billion years in the past at the center of an infant galaxy. This supermassive black hole appeared a mere 440 million years after the beginning of the universe. But it's just one of the countless black holes that inflated to terrifying scales during the dawn of the cosmos. It's the period about 100 million years after the Big Bang. That's when the young universe started to glow for a billion years. This discovery of the universe's oldest black hole can provide astronomers with the answers to some vital questions. For example, how could these space whirlpools balloon in scale so fast after the universe began? Or how did they appear in the first place? You see, black holes in the early universe couldn't grow as quietly and steadily as many modern black holes do. They were bound to experience some peculiar formation and growth. At the same time, closer to the present day, black holes are believed to be born from the collapse of ginormous stars. They grow by munching on gas, dust, stars, and other black holes non-stop. The friction created in the process makes the material, spiraling into a black hole, heat up, and it emits light that can be detected by our telescopes. To spot the oldest black hole, scientists used two infrared cameras, the JWST's mid-infrared instrument and near-infrared camera. They used the camera's built-in spectrographs to break down the light it had been recording into its component frequencies. While examining the results, they discovered unusual spikes among certain frequencies. It could only mean that the hot material around a massive black hole was beaming out faint traces of light. One of the most popular explanations for how ancient black holes grew so rapidly is that they appeared after sudden collapses of colossal gas clouds or they could form as a result of merges between clumps of stars and black holes. There's also a possibility that some of the oldest black holes could have been seeded by hypothetical primordial black holes. Those are believed to have appeared moments after the universe began, but their existence hasn't been proven yet. In any case, this most recent finding of the ancient black hole is extremely important because the formation of galaxies and the appearance of black holes go hand in hand. Every normal-sized galaxy that we know of has a black hole at its center. But even though such black holes are massive and can weigh millions and billions of solar masses, they are still tiny in comparison with their home galaxies. A supermassive black hole usually reaches less than 1% of the mass of a regular-sized galaxy and has a volume that is billions of times smaller. And still, somehow, supermassive black holes can influence galaxies, controlling the formation of stars for billions of years. The thing is, black holes exert an enormous gravitational pull on their surroundings. Any gas, dust, and stars that come too close to a black hole find themselves trapped. A lot of material crams into the space around the black hole and heats up, because that's what materials do when compressed. Soon, everything around the black hole flattens into a thin disk, which is called the accretion disk, and starts swirling around the black hole. Astronomers believe that this process is behind the mysterious relationship between black holes and their host galaxies. 
It's a connection between the mass of the supermassive black hole and the velocity dispersion of the gas in the galactic core. This cycle also controls the rate of star formation, which is a crucial element of the evolution of galaxies. If this delicately balanced process goes off kilter, the outflows from black holes can get too strong, not only heating the gas in a galaxy, but also removing it altogether. And then, the formation of stars doesn't simply slow down, it stops completely. Major galactic merger events can lead to such dramatic consequences because too much material falls into the central black hole too fast. So Venus and Earth are so different that a foolish question like, what's longer, a day or a year, that makes absolutely no sense on Earth, totally makes sense on Venus. A day on Venus is indeed longer than a year. If we put it into Earth's perspective, a day on Venus would equal 243 Earth days, while a year would only last 225 days. So it's like your birthday is every day. Venus is often nicknamed Earth's evil twin. Their differences are so stark, you'd think they're from different galaxies altogether. Just to give you an idea of how far apart they are, if the day-to-year ratio wasn't enough, the Earth rises in the west on Venus but sets in the east. These days, one of the very few similarities between these two is their size. But try to imagine a time when Venus and Earth were like peas in a pod besties since the beginning of the solar system. Venus used to be the life of the party. NASA scientists think Venus might have even hosted a liquid water ocean in surface temperatures that could have welcomed life for up to 2 billion years. But modern-day Venus is a different story. We're talking extreme temperatures and a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. So what led to this cosmic makeover? Size, location, and attitude. I mean that the distance from the Sun and internal heat played a huge role in shaping Venus and Earth's destinies. By the way, there used to be three siblings that could have hosted life – Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now imagine three cupcakes in an oven. Once they were fully baked, they were taken out of the oven. One of them was put in front of an open window in the middle of winter. Another was carefully placed on a table and covered with a nice clean kitchen towel. And the last one was accidentally forgotten and left in the oven. Oops. Mars, Earth, and Venus are like those cupcakes. Mars got too cold and not welcoming. Earth is still nice and warm and well-protected from all the unpleasant things, just like the towel protects that lucky cupcake. And Venus got scorching hot and impossible to consume. In terms of development, Earth took the slow and steady route, maintaining its oceans, stable atmosphere, and biodiversity. Venus, on the other hand, cranked up the temperature, evaporated its oceans, and went all in with greenhouse gases. As a result, we have a planet where you'll melt faster than a snowman in July. Mars, on the contrary, will turn you into an ice popsicle within seconds. But chances are, it might have been pretty hospitable at some point. Some scientists believe that Mars used to be covered with flowing rivers and lakes, and had no water shortages. Even today, Mars still has an ocean called Oceanus Borealis, or rather, the remains of what once used to be an ocean. It lost nearly all its water over time. Now, the sources of water on Mars include polar ice caps and minerals and rocks. According to estimates, only 1% of all that water evaporated, while 99% is still locked in the red planet. Ice polar caps are pretty simple to understand, as we have the same thing on Earth. But rocks containing water? Simple. There are at least four types of hydrous minerals on Mars. There are hydrous clays made of silicon oxygen. And the cool thing about them is that they can even contain magnesium and iron, which are sulfur-based hydrous sulfates. Now, don't you? I know you thought of the smell of rotten eggs. But it's typical of hydrogen sulfur and not just sulfur. These minerals have water incorporated right into their chemical formulas. There's also hydrous silica, which has water locked in its formula, too. Scientists have experimented with growing plants using Martian-like conditions and found success with alfalfa. Harvesting alfalfa also helped improve the growth of other crops, like turnips and lettuce. While water may be available on the red planet, the air on Mars is mostly carbon dioxide. On the bright side, and we are, 
the Mars Oxygen in situ resource utilization experiment are the Mars Ox Oxy can produce oxygen on Mars, which could be crucial for future missions. As for energy sources on Mars, solar, wind, and geothermal energy are a few promising options. Solar power is less effective on Mars due to weaker sunlight and dust storms. But wind power and geothermal energy could serve as reliable alternatives. With these sources in place, humans could potentially sustain life on Mars. But let's get back to comparing our sibling planets. While both Mars and Earth have moons, and Mars even has two of them, Venus has zero, just like Mercury. Due to its proximity to the Sun and the star's gravitational pull, Mercury lacks the ability to retain its own moon. The likelihood of any moon orbiting Mercury either colliding with the planet or being drawn into the orbit of the Sun is high. That's all clear and understandable. But the absence of moons around Venus remains an unsolved puzzle for scientists. Despite Venus's scorching hot temperatures, scientists think that even today, it might not be as hostile to life as we once thought. A recent MIT study found 19 amino acids surviving in a Venus-like solution for the whole month. Yep, some like it hot. Also, Rocket Lab and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology are teaming up to send an uncrewed spacecraft, Venus Life Finder, on a mission to Venus. This spacecraft will search for signs of life in the Venusian atmosphere using a special instrument called an autofluorescing nephelometer. And no, I didn't make that up. Originally set to launch in 2023, the mission is now pushed back to December 2024 with arrival at Venus in May 2025. The goal of the mission is to discover organic compounds in Venus's atmosphere, which could point to the possibility of habitable conditions in the cloud layer. The spacecraft is designed with a Photon Explorer cruise stage and a compact atmospheric probe equipped with that nephelometer thingy. The small probe will descend through the Venusian atmosphere, collecting data on cloud particles and organic compounds. In 2020, scientists made a big announcement about finding phosphine on Venus, a compound that could be linked to life. While they're still working on confirming this, using information from telescopes or even past missions, there might be evidence hidden in old NASA data received from Venus that could shed more light on the discovery. The potential presence of phosphine on Venus has stirred excitement and caution among scientists. To make sure, they need more data from telescopes or new space missions. If they find this gas, it might mean there is some form of life producing it in the planet's clouds. This discovery would be a huge step toward understanding Venus better. Some experts think that sending probes to Venus to directly detect phosphine would be the most effective way to confirm its presence. An 80s NASA mission may have already detected phosphine, but scientists back then didn't realize it. Now this data is being re-evaluated to uncover any overlooked evidence of the presence of the gas. This could also suggest that the compound has been in Venus's atmosphere for decades, raising questions about its source. But not everyone is convinced of this interpretation, which evokes a debate among scientists about the true nature of the detected gases. Old data from other missions may also hold clues about phosphate on Venus. While new spacecraft are going to explore the planet, it's possible that the key to unlocking this mystery lies in decades-old mission records. In total, there have been 46 space missions to Venus, including some flybys where gravity lent a helping hand. The last time we successfully landed a spacecraft on Venus was way back in June 1985 as part of the Vega 2 mission. So, let's see what Venus Life Finder will discover. It took a lot of time for the light emitted by several incredibly old galaxies to reach the James Webb Space Telescope. After scientists made more precise estimates, it turned out that the photons had been on the way for over 13 billion years. That's about as long as the entire history of the universe, and only recently have they reached our orbiting observatory. These dramatic results have revealed that the universe started creating stars almost immediately after the Big Bang. But if you look at the images delivered by the James Webb, you won't be overly impressed. Just a handful of smudges, a few glowing spheres, and something resembling a dog bone. And still, the world of astronomy has been left speechless. 
the telescope's giant mirror has managed to capture the oldest known galaxy in the entire universe. The galaxy got quite a prosaic name, mostly consisting of letters and numbers. Yeah, that's rather catchy. It appeared a mere 320 million years after the Big Bang. In comparison with our home galaxy, this ancient one was tiny. But after its birth, it started vigorously producing new stars at a rate comparable to that of the Milky Way. Interestingly, the Webb telescope has managed to photograph a few other ancient galaxies that had the same characteristics. Based on the snapshots of the baby universe we've got, we can conclude that in those ancient times, the first galaxies and stars were evolving amazingly fast. They also appeared much earlier than most scientists thought. Now, let's talk about the hero of the day, the outstanding telescope itself. The James Webb Space Telescope is a stunning piece of equipment. It's around 100 times more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope, and the latter has observed places that are 13.4 billion light-years away. The James Webb Telescope is also on the pricey side, to put it mildly. Even though originally the cost of the telescope was estimated to be just $1 to $3.5 billion, the entire process of its construction cost around $10 billion. For comparison, NASA spent $4.7 billion to build and launch the Hubble telescope. And it was another $1.3 billion to fix it in orbit. Even though the James Webb Space Telescope itself is three stories high and the size of a tennis court, its mirrors are the lightest large telescope mirrors of all time. No wonder, during the manufacturing process, they underwent a 92% reduction in weight. The lighter, the cheaper it is to send stuff to space. If you had a chance to look at these mirrors, they would seem to be gold. But they're made of beryllium. This is a steel-gray, lightweight, and brittle metal. A gold coating is still applied to each mirror. But they can't be produced entirely out of gold, since this material needs to expand and contract even with small temperature changes. And that's not what we need to happen to a super-precise piece of equipment. That's why the total amount of gold used in the construction of the James Webb Telescope is less than 2 ounces. That's a golf ball-sized chunk of gold. The gold plates covering the mirror are only 1,000 atoms thick. If we speak about all those incredible feats the telescope is capable of, it can clearly see a U.S. penny from 24 miles away and a football from 340 miles away. Hey, what's the score? JWST comes with significant advantages over any previous mission. For example, its 21-foot mirror is composed of 18 gold-plated hexagonal segments. They gather more than six times as much light as the Hubble Space Telescope's almost 8-foot mirror. It means that James Webb can record light from all kinds of space objects six times faster than its predecessor. The telescope's sensitivity to infrared light is also astonishing, which is remarkable since it can see different things than optical telescopes. You can say it's a real game-changer. The James Webb can observe wavelengths from 0.6 to 28.5 micrometers, from the red end of the visible spectrum to the mid-infrared. As for Hubble's optics, most of the telescope's sensitivity is centered on visible light. It might sound surprising, but in its intended infrared domain, the Webb telescope isn't likely to resolve finer details than Hubble can detect in optical light. The thing is that although resolution increases with the mirror size, it also diminishes with wavelength. James Webb's telescope side cools itself down because, otherwise, it might get damaged or even burn. Normally, its temperature doesn't rise higher than minus 370 degrees Fahrenheit. That's cold enough to make hydrogen liquid. An enormous five-layer sunshield surrounds the telescope and reflects as much sunlight as possible, letting the telescope stay cool. The telescope was launched near the equator because Earth spins a bit faster there, and this gave the rocket some extra push. When the James Webb Space Telescope runs out of fuel, it'll just keep orbiting the Sun. On the other hand, even though the telescope wasn't designed to be serviced or upgraded, it might potentially be refueled with the help of robots in the future. This might extend its lifespan. Anyway, here are the reasons why we can say this telescope has changed astronomy. For one thing, we might finally see dark matter. 
around 84% of matter in the universe doesn't emit or absorb light. Astronomers call this stuff, which can neither be seen directly nor detected by indirect means, dark matter. It affects visible matter, radiation, and the very structure of the universe. Dark matter is like some binding agent of our universe, and we're still not sure whether it exists. And now, thanks to the James Webb Telescope, scientists might finally have a way to seek dark matter. It's a huge development that is likely to change the way we observe the known as well as unknown universe. Even though astronomers haven't seen dark matter directly yet, they have been able to trace the distribution of this mysterious universal compound, all thanks to James Webb's powerful instruments. Another reason the new space telescope is so cool is that it helps us learn more about star formation. This process has always been a foundational part of astronomical studies. But even though Hubble has provided us with some iconic images and observations, there are still many unanswered questions about how stars form and go out. But astronomers are sure that James Webb will fill in the blanks. All because this telescope can peer further and deeper into the universe than any other telescope that has ever existed. Its location and cutting-edge equipment allow it to gaze through gases and dust surrounding early galaxies and stars. It will let us get a better look at star formation. It's also obvious that Webb's discoveries are bound to change the way we think of the early universe. For example, recently, the telescope has revealed several large galaxies that scientists believe existed not long after the Big Bang. They aren't supposed to be there, and no one expected to find them. And still, the James Webb Space Telescope has spotted them. These six galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, are full of mature red stars. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from them and estimated their age 5 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. The most bizarre thing about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars inhabiting them. This information doesn't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. Plus, it doesn't match the earlier observations made by Hubble. Astronomers hope that one day, James Webb will help us find new exoplanets and even detect water there. For a long time, astronomers have been discovering planets orbiting stars outside the solar system by monitoring slight dips in stars' light. Such dips happen when planets pass in front of them, and reading unique signatures in the light can tell us about planets' chemical composition. The strongest and most readable signatures happen within the infrared spectrum. Have you just thought of James Webb's state-of-the-art infrared instruments too? They can help scientists spot new planets and even identify the presence of water there. Guess what? Scientists have come up with a cool idea about some cosmic creatures saying hello to us from the center of the Milky Way. Astronomers are all excited about finding extraterrestrial life, so they're focusing their search right at the heart of our galaxy. Imagine stars in outer space, like super cool DJs, spinning their own unique beats. But instead of music, they send out these special signals called radio pulses. It's their way of saying, hey, what's up, universe? These radio pulses are basically little bursts of energy that travel through space. They're not just random noise, though. They have a specific pattern that makes them stand out from all the other sounds out there. It's like a secret code or a special rhythm that only these stars know how to create. Scientists are super curious about these radio pulses because they think that maybe, just maybe, intelligent beings from other planets could be using them, too. It's like a galactic language that they could use to talk to each other. So, these clever scientists created special tools and software to listen in on these signals. It's kind of like tuning into your favorite radio station, but instead of music or talk shows, they're trying to catch these cosmic beats. They're hoping to find those unique patterns that could be a sign of other space beings trying to communicate with us. They used a super cool telescope called the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia to collect data and search for these signals. But here's the twist. They didn't find anything this time. No worries, though. Because their fancy software is lightning fast, 
and it'll help them search even better next time. But why did they pick the center of the Milky Way for this ET life hunt? Well, that's because the galaxy's hearts are packed with stars. In other words, there should be many more planets in there, which means more potential places for life. Plus, if there are super-smart life forms at the core of our galaxy, they could easily send signals to lots of planets all at once. Yeah, <laughs> sneaky, huh? This whole thing is super exciting because it's the first time scientists have gone all out to search for these types of signals. They think that using specific frequency ranges and repeating patterns is a really clever way for ET beings to make themselves known. I mean, that combo is so unlikely to happen naturally, right? The best part is that they have this algorithm thingy that can go through a crazy amount of telescope data in just 30 minutes. So even though they didn't find anything yet, they're confident that this speedy method will help them find evidence of advanced life in the future. How awesome would that be? As you know, humanity has been searching for buddies from outer space for a very long time. This research is just one of many attempts to find them. There's a whole institute dedicated to this mission in the US, SETI, or Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So naturally, the question arises, why haven't we found anyone yet? It's like we've been scanning the sky forever, hoping to catch a glimpse of advanced civilizations out there. But we get absolutely nothing. All this brings us to the famous Fermi Paradox. It's like a big mystery that fuels the hunt for extraterrestrial intelligence. We think that if intelligent life exists, we'd have evidence of it by now. Maybe they're actually beaming out radio signals for us to pick up. Or maybe they're just broadcasting in general and we happen to stumble upon it. They could even have left cool artifacts in our solar system to keep an eye on us or just hang out. Heck, maybe they're building wild mega-engineering projects, like gigantic solar panels around their stars. Or they could be getting all fancy and contaminating their stars with heavy metals just to announce their presence. So the search continues. We're not giving up just yet. And hey, maybe instead of just focusing on smart space beings, we should be on the lookout for any kind of life at all. Yeah, yeah, I know that a tiny microbe might not be as thrilling as chatting with friendly otherworldly creatures. But think about it. There could be lots of simple life forms out there. We're talking about simple organisms swimming in oceans, mossy creatures holding onto rocks, or the first signs of critters exploring their habitats. They might not be super brainy, but they leave their mark. Plus, they could be way more common and easier to find in our galaxy. Now take Earth, for example. There's a theory that our atmosphere used to have a lot of oxygen floating around. But oxygen is a bit wild and doesn't stick around for too long. It either escapes into space or bonds with other elements, changing into different things like carbon dioxide. Then, around 2 billion years ago, single-celled organisms decided to gobble up carbon dioxide and burp out oxygen, completely changing Earth's atmosphere. Life here transformed the very nature of our planet. And guess what? We can actually detect changes like that on other planets. Here's how. When we look at faraway planets called exoplanets, sometimes they cross in front of their parent stars. As the star's light passes through the planet's atmosphere, it gets all mixed up with different elements and molecules in the air. And you know what happens? The light changes its flavor and color in a special way. So imagine you had a glass of lemonade and you added some fruit juice to it. The lemonade would taste different, right? Well, it's kind of like that with exoplanet atmospheres. When we see the star's light that has traveled through the planet's atmosphere, it gives us clues about what's in the air and how it's different from just the star's light alone. So by studying these changes in light, we can figure out what kinds of elements and molecules are present in the atmosphere of a faraway planet. It's like a cosmic chemistry experiment, and it helps us learn more about whether there might be life out there. So right now, we can only study the atmospheres of big planets that orbit really close to their stars. But don't worry, NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite is on the case. It's finding lots of interesting planets that we can check out more closely with the super-powered James Webb Space Telescope. 
This amazing telescope can even sniff out if there's too much carbon dioxide on other worlds. And okay, let's be real, our first contact probably won't be as flashy as in the movies. No exchanging secret codes or figuring out ET customs. We won't be chatting about funky bodies or habits either. Instead, the first hint of life out there will most likely come as a little wiggly line on a graph. It shows us that living creatures have really shaken things up on their home planet. Even simple life forms can have a big impact on their environment and leave behind a noticeable trace. Sure, it might not be as wild as battling space robots or epic adventures, but imagine this. Finding any kind of life beyond Earth would be huge. We'd be calling home, sending messages like, guess what, we're not alone in the universe. It would be an historic moment we're celebrating. And by the way, we've already begun to find organic molecules in space. It's not a full-fledged life as we imagine it, but it's still pretty neat. For example, we've already started to find organic compounds on Mars. And there's a teeny tiny chance that Mars once flourished with plants, and maybe even animals. This is just a possibility, but if it turns out to be true, it would show that the presence of living organisms in the universe is not as rare as it seems. The search for life in the universe is like a great detective game. We thought that finding it would be easier because they could do cool stuff like blasting radio signals or transforming their whole solar system. But looks like, in reality, things are much more complicated. Nevertheless, we shouldn't give up. Let's keep searching and hoping that this new study about radio signals brings some results.